There are no days off on the recruiting trail. And Jeff Fish and his staff were doing some big things over the weekend. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes from inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. And as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, and these days every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes river for your small business because this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. And that's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college terms and conditions apply. So Lars, speaking of LinkedIn, we've got a whole lot of recruitment news to get to today. The first one, let's start here because uh, Anso uh, Sanoe, who's a top 100 prospect in class 2026, was on campus this weekend. That's 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 a big way to start this off. But I feel like we need to talk about Philip Bleedy first because Philip Bleedy is a grad transfer defensive tackle from Indiana who received an offer from Washington and has set up an official visit for the beginning of April and he looks like a kind of guy who could come in right away and just have a big impact, especially next to Sebastian Valdez, the Montana State transfer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of one of those, probably as the coaches have seen the winter conditioning workouts, it's just good to have it. And we kind of touched on it on the show. It's good to have another truly experienced body. As we mentioned before the show, he was Indiana's third highest graded defensive player in se- on the season. Again, granted, Indiana wasn't that great this past season, but again, when you're looking at some of these kind of one year off guys, like, Hey, you're trying to get the best of a guy that's probably going to help make you even better. And so when you look at Washington's defensive line, to your point, bringing in Sebastian Valdez from Montana state, good looking player, but again, hasn't done it at the power five level. So you want to make sure you, you have another experienced body. I mean, um, Sebastian Valdez, uh, uh, Jacob Bandis, um, is still on the roster at least at this point, but again, that, that could be, you know, influx or things like that. And so, Just having that, you don't want to push the Parkers unless they have to, but just having another truly good interior body is just kind of a more reassuring take heading into fall camp. So I disagree. I think it is time to push Javon Parker at the very least. Where we're going to see what Armand Parker has. I, I'm I'm personally really excited about that, and that's one thing that I'm watching for over the course of spring practice. But Javon Parker's a junior now. It's it's time to just say, okay, we need you to step up and move into a bigger role. And I think that's something that's going to happen this season. I wouldn't be surprised if he starts over one of these more experienced guys, and then a bleedy especially just ends up being a really, really big rotational piece where he's what Fatui Tuitele was last year, where, you know, he started a couple games, but he was never necessarily like the the biggest answer along the defensive line. He still stepped up and made plays in a couple of different spots, but it was never like he was never the primary where it was always Thule and MJ Ale. And I feel like that could be Valdez and Javon Parker this year. And then, uh, Armand Bleedy and Jacob Bandis behind him are kind of that that next wave of guys. But I, I do think that we need to talk about Anso Sanoe, where there's a whole lot going on in terms of 2025, but getting some top uh, top 2026 kids on campus is really important too, where he's a top 100 rated player per 247 sports. He's got a couple of crystal, crystal balls to Oregon State, and that's really impressive considering his offer list, which has Georgia, Oregon, Miami, Tennessee, Texas A&M all on there. So getting him on campus is big, and obviously with the 2026 kid, there's still a long way to go in his recruitment, but this feels like a good sign, especially for a running backs coach, Scotty Graham. Exactly. I mean, I think it's one of those when, again, obviously the 25 class is going to be the most pivotal for Jed Fish to lay his foundation, right? The 24 class is kind yeah. of a wash. Also, too, you know, again, the long-term future of the program, when you think about, you know, you want to get those 26 guys on campus as much as possible, those 27 kids on campus as much as possible for unofficial visits, especially a kid from Oregon, right? Lake Oswego, Oregon. So yeah. you can make the drive up by five. It's it's when you're with, when you have top 100, 150 kids in the Northwest area, especially as underclassmen, those are guys you want to get on campus as much time as possible. And so getting it early with some of these guys. Now, again, the reason why Oregon State, to your point, might have some crystal balls is because I believe they were the second school to offer him back in like 2022. Yeah. So they, they, Oregon State's been in on him since he was a freshman or eighth grade freshman year. So now to the good news for Washington, Arizona did offer him last, I believe last July, or sometime last year. But Washington did not. So the, even though Kalen yeah, Washington offered him last month, they're they're the most right. recent offer for him. 
Exactly. No, but I think because Kalen DeBoer did not have any prior, they didn't that the prior staff didn't build up a relationship with him. Now Jed is kind of having to play catch up in terms of a location, but he's already in Scotty Graham have already had some form of a relationship, having offered him in Arizona. So I think it's a good sign now that the staff is moving up to Washington that some of the guys that maybe the previous staff missed on are now already having solid relationships with the Arizona, the former Arizona staff. And now they just have to get acquainted with Washington. So getting these kids on campus as much as possible before their junior and senior year is pretty important. Absolutely. And especially when you, when you look at him in particular, uh, just going back and watching his film for something I wrote over on Huskies wire a little bit earlier is this, this kid's athleticism and his body type and his frame are going to play very, very well at the college level where this looks like the kind of player that you might not necessarily need to redshirt when he's listed at six foot two, 210 pounds. And you just look at his frame, you look at his balance, the, his ability to change direction. And then you look at his ranking and you say, yeah, that makes sense. Where there are a lot of guys where one of our favorite prospects in the 2025 class is Matai Shagoi, where he shows a lot of those intangibles. He shows that uh, that explosiveness, but his frame isn't necessarily all the way there yet, where he's got a lot of room to add weight. That's not necessarily the case with Sanoe, where you look at him and you just say, oh, yeah, this dude could come in and have a role as a true freshman, where he's as big as some of the linebackers that he's going to play against, even in the Big Ten. So, yeah, I that that's that's one guy where when I look at him, I just say, yeah, this this looks like he's going to be a very very big target going forward. And honestly, good on Scotty Graham for making him a priority, offering him just a couple weeks after a Washington staff got settled. Obviously, focus focusing a little bit more on 2024 and 2025 first, but this he, it looks like they've made him a priority. And obviously with having crystal balls to Oregon state, including one from Brandon Huffman, that means that there's a slight chance he's going to want to stay out West and fight, you know, obviously George is going to probably try to make a push for him. Miami might make a push, but if you can find a way to keep this kid on the West coast and that that's where he's looking, you got to push really, really hard to get him back on campus in the fall. Exactly. I bet in order to do that, having that first visit in the offseason to actually develop that relationship again, Scotty Graham already knows him from offering him in Arizona. Yeah. So it's just kind of getting acquainted with him at Washington. That's one thing that I think that people, it's important for fans to understand. There's two kind of unofficial visits coming up for a game where you're just seeing the game, kind of maybe shaking hands with the coaches, maybe doing a pregame tour of the stadium or something like that, but there's not a ton of time to actually get, you know, acquainted. You're kind of just there to watch the game, see it, and then go home. When you come in in the off season, you really have time to you know walk watch practice with the coaches, you know sit in their office for two or three or four hours versus on game day where they don't really have that time because you know Saturday they're going through walkthrough and then Sun or Friday they're going through walkthrough and Saturday is the game. Sunday usually people are gone unless you're on an official visit. So getting that sp specific off season time first then makes it easier for guys to just come up for game days whenever because the relationship is already solidified. Right. And speaking of relationships that are solidified, uh, shout out to Jordan Pow Pow. He scheduled another uh, official visit over the weekend as three-star tight end Cal Kellen Ford from down in California. And he's somebody who I like his tape. I think he looks really good. And this, Lars, it's something you and I talked about at length last week, especially when we talked about Noah Flores and Teandre Waverly, a couple of in-state tight ends. But this is another guy who he's going to be visiting, looks like beginning of May. And he's somebody where when I watch him, I say, okay, yeah, I could absolutely see the, him being one of the two takes. And Pavel's done a really good job overall, just building relationships with a lot of tight ends in this class. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, it's kind of one of the, the hallmarks of the staff is there's just so many guys that just have a ton of relationships and this pays off short and long-term where you cast a wide net, you still have your list, right? Here's the top five. Like if I could choose, right, this is who I want. This is the second guy. And then if I can't get either of those or one of the two, then I kind of work my way down the list, but you still cast that wide net because again, down the road, two, three years in the portal, who knows what you need, having all these relationships develop allows you to get as many guys on campus, see as much top. And the thing is, they're all top talent, right? You know, yeah. Bear Tanny, Kellen Ford, all these guys, they're big time targets by multiple schools. They're not just, and eh, it's this guy from, you know, Wyoming, you know, no offense to Wyoming, but it's like, it's not just guys, it's not just casting a wide net to cast a wide net. These are all guys that are coveted by top schools across the country. So Jordan Papa having all these relationships, it almost kind of allows him to say, this is who I want versus, oh, well, who do we kind of have to settle for? Who do we have to maybe yeah. try and flip later on? No, I, absolutely. And, and with that being said, let's switch gears here a little bit. And let's let's talk a little bit about your boy, Roger Rosengarten. 
right after a message from our friends over at Nissan. Because this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. And the Oakland Golden Grizzlies are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with that powerful performance in the first round upset against Kentucky Wildcats, busting so many brackets and giving them their biggest win in program history. They say win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies have done here. You can take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. And you could do all of that by shopping at NissanUSA.com. And speaking of the of the Oakland Golden Grizzlies and Boston Brackets, we have got to give a shout out with our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook because you can say goodbye to Buster Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. And hey, personally, I appreciate saying goodbye to Buster Brackets because Utah State, man, they, they they didn't look too great today. And that's that was rough for me. I, I had them going all the way to the Elite Eight. And whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So, Lars, shout out to Roger Rosengarten. Mel Kuyper put out his latest mock draft last week, and he has Roger Rosengarten sneaking all the way up into the first round and has him go in 31st overall to the San Francisco 49ers. And I, I could not think of a better fit for him personally. I was going to say, I mean, it's the perfect kind of, it's what I've always kind of thought, right? Where every, for everyone that always questioned, oh, you know, maybe Roger is a second, third round pick, you know, he, he needs to show a little bit more. It's, when you talk to him, when you go watch the tape, when you see his projectability, and then you find out who he was coached with starting in high school with two former NFL offensive linemen in Tyler Columbus and Ben Hamilton, who I believe played, what, 25, 30 almost years combined in the league, something like that, where it's like, hey, like, I think he's known what he's had to do for a long time. And, and he right. honestly, without COVID, he's probably gone last year. Like, in terms of that, that COVID season and the 21 season as a result. I, where, so where Victor I disagree Curry played, personally. I, I disagree personally. Sorry. And it's just, it's from the, the, the strict aspect of everybody else came back last year. And when you look at it, I feel that he would have been one of those guys to be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to come back for this championship run. Uh, uh, that, that's a fair, that's a fair cap. But, but aside from that, he would, a guy who would have been a first round pick last year, kind of like Roma Dunes, where sure, he probably yeah. could have been a second first round pick last year, solidified himself as a first round pick this year. I think that's kind of how I've always viewed Roger Rosen because he's so athletic. He's held up in the, I mean, Every time you watch the Oregon game, whether it's twenty two or twenty three, every time he just he never struggled. I mean, he he might yeah. you know get pushed a little bit, but he always seemed to respond. And when you look at how many times Michael Penix was sacked in his UW career, Troy Fontana on the left side did have a key part, but as the left handed quarterback protecting Michael Penix's blind side, it was Roger Rosengard. And that was his Absolutely. show. And so I I think going projecting him to San Francisco, I mean, could you envision a better Kyle Shanahan offensive lineman? Just, no, just for that, everything that, that Roger has in his tank, like he's a perfect. Player. Oh, absolutely. That that's one of the things that makes it so perfect with just everything that he likes to do in terms of running the football. He can stretch really well. He he just does everything that Kyle Shanahan would look for, which is one of the reasons that this is such a great fit. And I want to circle back to something you said in terms of him being a borderline first round pick because Mel Kuyper agreed with you as well. Where it's, he also agreed with something that, you know, you and I were talking about a couple of months ago when we were talking about should Roger come back for one more season. And one of the things that he discussed was, hey, if he came back, he could have been a top 10, top 15 pick in the next offensive line class. It just It's not the same as what this class is, but Roger went out. He performed really well at the Senior Bowl, and he's done everything in his power so far to raise his stock. And, you know, with the Pro Day coming later this week, keep, keep an eye out for that. We're going to have a really fun Pro Day preview episode with, with everything that's just he's done throughout the course of this offseason. He's does nothing but raise his stock and raise his stock and raise his stock, which in this offensive line class is super impressive because Troy Fautanu, some people have him as a top 10 pick now where he's move that high up on some people's boards. You look at Talisi Fuaga at right tackle. You look at, it's just some of the other right tackles in this as well with him, with JC Latham, with Tyler Guyton. There are so many players around this draft class where you can say, oh yeah, 
just especially at offensive tackle where, oh yeah, if that guy ends up as a first round pick, that's not surprising. And it's it's credit to Roger for being able to put himself into this discussion. And for, you know, for Husky fans, it's not necessarily a surprise to see this because he's done this for two years. But for a lot of the country where, you know, all the hype was around Troy Fautano and when he watched Washington, the hype was never, like the offensive line was awesome. But it was never the first thing people focused on. It was the receivers. It was Michael Penix. It was Dylan Johnson to an extent this past season. And then it was, oh, yeah, hey, just shout out to their offensive line. Their offensive line is really good, too. And, of course, they go out and win the Joe Moore Award this year. But it just felt like that was never the primary point of discussion. And it's really cool to see Roger go out there and really just make a name for himself. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm glad you said all that because it's kind of, if you think about what you're saying, and I know you are, but saying, like, the, the reason why I mention this is because when you have such a good offensive line, you don't think about it. That's right. why. Like when you're when you're watching the game, it's like, oh, look at that pass to Rome. Look at that run by Dylan. It's like, wow. There's, that the only the singular only way that happens is if you have a really good offensive line. Like if if Penix is running for his life, well, you're probably saying, hey, look at Penix has to run for his life and make all these plays. And by the way, Penix does not Caleb Williams, despite his great arm talent. He does not have the op- for sure. total athleticism that Caleb does. That's no slight to Michael, but. With that being said, this is why the draft process and the draft evaluation, especially postseason, is always essential because that's when actual NFL execs and actual scouts go back and look at the tape. It's like, wow, yeah, we were looking at all the receivers because of all the numbers they were putting up. But they actually have a pretty good offensive line. Like, the reason why we like these other guys is because we should like these guys too. And then you start to – and that's the thing I'm glad you also mentioned earlier with Roger at the Senior Bowl. It's like he's done everything that he, – did he have to go to the Senior Bowl? No. He could have just been like, hey, like, I'll go do my pro day. I'll do some workouts, but I don't feel like I need to show myself. He's tested himself every time and checked and passed with flying colors every time. I mean, he was one of Jim Nagy's top players at the Senior Bowl. Like, it wasn't just that he, like, showed good and, like, hey, you know, scouts are kind of talking about you. It's like, you know, like the, the old line from the rookie with Dennis Quarry. He's like, you got him talking, coach. Like, yeah, I'm 45. Like, I sh- yeah. they're probably talking about how old I am, not, not, not how good I am. It's one of those where it's like, no, like, hey, like, you maintain in the conversation and now to have Mel Kuyper, who's again, Mel Kuyper isn't the end all be all, but it's one of those where, okay, if he's saying it, you, especially as the process goes along, it's not like, Hey, like this guy's falling. It's like, Oh, well, is he actually going to fall in draft day? Oh, he did fall a little bit. Oh, he rose. That's why, because scouts yeah. and execs have been seeing that and all come to an agreement where Troy Fatano, to your point, going to be a top 15, probably top 12 pick. Conservative. For sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. But Rogers deserved when you look at the how the season went. It wasn't just Troy, and I think that's especially when you win the Joe Moore Award for the entire offensive line. It wasn't just like winning the Morris Trophy or winning the you know the best offensive line singular player in the country. It was as a unit these guys did that. Now the other three are still in college, so there's not much you can do about that. But especially with what he did protecting Penix's blind side <laughs> after the injury history that Penix had at Indiana, where it's like, hey, if Roger misses one of these blocks. Penix might go down permanently, right? It's like that was the yeah, sure things coming. could look very different. Yeah, that, well, that, that was the perception. I mean, that wasn't that wasn't anywhere yeah. near the truth. It was just one of that was the perception coming in. And for two years, Roger Rosengarten held down a right tackle. And I talked with Tyler Columbus on multiple occasions, and he said he can play left tackle. It's just in that offense, why move Troy right and Roger left? I mean, it, if they're already there, just put them there. Like it doesn't right. it doesn't necessarily matter? And they ended up holding because that's the thing is defenses would always flip their edges and the, the success rate was still about the same. It was next, not next to zero. It was relatively zero. So two things for you here. The first one, I appreciate any shout out to the rookie. Fantastic reference by you. An elite movie. Second, we just got to give a lot of credit to Scott Huff, man, with, with all of this, he deserves so much credit for all this. And since, you know, as, as the everydayers know, or because they can see it, the title of this episode is all about recruit. And, this is exactly what you want to see from a borderline top 100 recruit. He comes in, he sits for a couple of years because there were questions about his weight where he just needed to get bigger, needed to get stronger. That happened. Washington did a fantastic job of getting him bigger, getting him stronger, helping him. Uh, I, I just from one, one thing I, I, I will always remember about watching Rogers tape out of high school is how aggressive he was and how just, I, I don't, I don't want to say over the top because it's not necessarily the right word, but just, how much of a nasty streak he had is probably the best way to put it in football terms and how he'd always play through the whistle, how he did all the right things. And Scott Huff was absolutely perfect in terms of developing him, getting him right, honing that aggression and 
perfecting his technique. And as a result, he could end up being probably at worst, you know, as we talked about him as maybe going 31st overall, we could see him going that high, but I don't think he makes that of the top 50 at this point. But the more, the more we look at this, it's just, it's really cool to see how that happened. And then look at what Jed Fish's staff is doing, where they did a fantastic job of developing a whole bunch of guys out in Arizona, where there are some very big shoes to spill to fill for Brennan Carroll, especially when it comes to talking about Scott Huff. But this seems like a really good way to transition into that. And if they can go out and, you know, pull in a couple more guys that like Jake Flores, who you and I really like Washington's one commit along the offensive line right now, if they can pull in a few more guys like that and put it, put them on a similar development path, then Washington could be in really, really good hands for years to come. And, you know, as long as we're on the topic of Roger Rosengarten going to the 49ers, which would be a fantastic fit, one team, one player, one fit, best one. We'll get there right after a message from our friends over at LinkedIn, because when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free, just like there are a couple openings around the Washington Athletic Department in, you know, uh, Lars, we call them premier openings right now between men's basketball and athletic directors. So, you know, you want to make sure you're finding the right professionals for those roles. And that's why LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place place to hire gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else linkedin does all that while making the process easy and intuitive hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates so easy in fact that 86 percent of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours because linkedin knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire linkedin is constantly finding ways to help make the hiring process easier they even just also feature that helps you write job descriptions making the process even easier and quicker you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college that's linkedin dot com slash lockdown college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply so lars roger rosengarten to the san francisco 49ers would be a really really fun fit but is that the single best fit you can think of if you took every uw draft eligible player from this year and you look at all 32 teams in the nfl what is the one player and the one team that you think is a match made in heaven. So I was going to, I was going to go two ways with this and I'm deciding to go the semi trolling route. Okay. <laughs> Troy, Troy Fautano. Okay. At 13 to the Oakland Raiders. Why? Oh man. Because it goes back home. He goes back home. All right. And I think that would be a cool – I honestly wanted to put Rome in that category, but the Raiders don't really need a receiver, even though I think that would be an electric – like, you know, Rome would oh, be a more electric. Oh, Adams would be insane. And, yeah. and, and, and so so that, that was kind of where I wanted to go with that. But I'm like, I do think it would actually be kind of cool to see – like, they, they do all, obviously need some offensive line help. So from an actual need and fit, that is more realistic and natural than saying Roma Dunes to the Raiders because I would like to say that. Sure. And I did want to say – Troy to the Seahawks, but the Raiders picked three before. So I do. If the Raiders pass, then I think we obviously know where Troy needs to go. No, absolutely. And yeah, putting him on the Seahawks would be super fun. And see, like that, that's kind of where I thought you were going to go with that, with letting him reunite with Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff doesn't have to leave the city. That would be really fun. So I've got a little different one in mind. I've got Roma Dunze to the Los Angeles Chargers at number five overall. You want to talk about a little bit of trolling, putting him with Justin Herbert. I know how Husky fans would feel about that. But also the whole cursed Chargers organization thing. Shout out to our, our buddy Alex Katz and his huge Chargers fan. But I just, I love that fit so much, man. When you look at the fact that they moved off of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams this offseason, they need a lot of help. Yeah, they need a lot of help along the offensive line too. But Justin Herbert needs a number one receiver between Quentin Johnston, Josh Palmer, and whoever the heck, just whoever the heck else is on their roster, including Simi Fajoko. Like, remember Simi Fajoko when he cooked Washington in, in the, 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 the 2020 COVID season? Like, he's still on that roster. One time top Washington target Simi Fajoko, too. Yeah, that's right. That was way back in the day. But People forget. I still, Yeah, I, 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 I forgot about that. But that's the Chargers receiving core right now. They need help. And they are in position to do whatever they want with the number five pick. If it's Joe Alt from Notre Dame, fine. If it's Malik Neighbors from LSU, fine. But Rome would be so much fun there. Because when I start looking past that, 
I look at number six, the Giants, and I, I not not just as me personally as a Patriots fan, but I don't want to see him paired with Daniel Jones. It's just not the same level of exciting that it would be with pairing him with Justin Herbert. Or like number number nine of the Chicago Bears would be a lot of fun. Between him, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, DeAndre Swift, Caleb Williams, that's an electric offense that honestly I think would be a sleeper as like a top five, top seven offense in the league next year as a whole. But I just, I really want to see him there because I think that would be a really fun connection where Rome would have to come in and just become a target hog where he would have to have like 110, 120 targets as a rookie and potentially be a thousand yard guy right off the bat. And I just think that would be so much fun. See, I find it interesting that there's one name in all those receivers that you didn't mention. And the ironic part of who they're not, who the Chargers head coach now is if he didn't. If yeah, he doesn't if he doesn't draft Marvin Harrison Jr. at five just because of the oh, Michigan Ohio State rivalry, that would be so funny. <laughs> if Jim Harbaugh's like, I'm not drafting an Ohio State guy, I I can't do that to myself. I would respect that draft. personally. I, I so I, I honestly thought that was like to to kind of follow my semi mock trolling of my mock trolling was instead of having him stay home with the obvious hit of grub and huff and all that, I'm gonna troll sure. the local guy and say he's gonna go a little bit before you just to just to undercut. But that would be even funnier if. Uh, they pass on because then if you think Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to what eight to the Giants, I, no, Marv, like like if if there are no trades, he'll go at four. He'll go at four to the to the Cardinals, and him and Kyler Murray will be a really fun pairing. But you said you had one other one, please. Yeah, feel free. Like, what, what else? Well, you got for well, us? well, so that that is kind of the other fit, which it goes back to Roger, right? So we can do yeah. or because the, the other thing I'm I'm curious about is some of these other guys that are not like going to be first round picks, but like Edifon Ocosio. Where a team that fit, like I would think, maybe the Pittsburgh Steelers, or I don't, I don't know, a couple of other teams that need linebackers, but there's a couple that need linebackers, and I'm thinking like Eddie is going to be one of those guys where if he's picked in the right spot, he could play for like 10, 12 years, just because he's got the build to be a linebacker. So it's kind of almost hard picking some of these guys' spots because again, the other one I was going to say was that we talked about in the last time was Roger going to the 49ers. Like I could not envision in terms of like fit location, go because he's from Colorado. So again, going to the West Coast, staying on the West Coast, that. There's a not a perfect fit. I, I honestly don't think of all the guys in the draft, even Pettix going to Tampa. Like I'm not sure there's a better fit because I don't think Rogers going to go to the Broncos. Obviously, unless they trade back or trade back up to get a unless he falls in the second round. But again, I don't. I truly don't think Rogers is going to fall out of the first round. Somebody might have to trade back up to get him if they want sure. to, you know, do that, and that's it becomes kind of a coveted pick. But man, if he can land with Kyle Shanahan, that dude could be a quick all pro in probably three or four or five years like that oh, i would not be yeah. su- i would not be surprised like does that offense just screams roger rosengarten so i i like that a lot and i see i was torn here because i wanted to talk about michael Penix. like that would be a lot of fun uh but the the more i think about it the more i want to just find a way to get braylon trice into this conversation yeah and when i look around there's a really scary fit that I think would be so much fun and they don't necessarily need an edge rusher, but I think about what Braylon tries would do if he landed on the Baltimore Ravens and how absolutely horrifying that would be where if David Ajabo comes back and is healthy, like I, I obviously there, there are a lot of cards that fall into place there, but I just, I think about when, Mike Tomlin would tell Patrick Queen that he he wasn't a Raven he was or, and now he's a Steeler with that whole thing, but Braylon Trice is the definition of a Raven, where he works really hard. He just he gives max effort on every single play, and pairing him with some of the other guys on that line, like defensive tackle Justin Matabuke, with just some of the guys they have up front, just what Braylon would be able to do on that team would be so much fun to watch. And as just a lover of defensive line play, I, I, I would be all over that. See, that's an interesting one because it, it's more about like, a, now the thing is, are we projecting with first rounders or second rounders? Cause there's so many guys. Where no, it's just, second. Cause if, because the Braylon falls to the second round, there's so many early picks in that top 15 range in the second round where I could easily see him going. I mean, I don't want to say him to the Carolina Panthers. Cause I feel like Kurt, Stop telling anybody that should go to the Panthers is just unfair. Like that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's they, like I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy, sort of thing. Like so, and Braylon certainly doesn't deserve that. But then another one in the second round, if they want to go back and add edge depth, is Tampa Bay. 
I, I do like that. Throw, throw they might Washington. go edge in the first round, though. My so well, I, the, the way I thought about this was beyond that. I just I thought about it as if okay, like this team is on the board, doesn't matter when, and they just say, oh, this guy is there, he would fit us perfectly. That's that's kind of how I thought about this. Yeah, and so I think one other fit that again we talked about Rome. They're going to have all three receivers drafted. One that I'm really intrigued that might is kind of an off the wall is Jalen Polk to the Denver Broncos. I think that one. <laughs> In, in, in terms of what Sean Payne wants as his receivers, again, yeah. there, it's more about timing, separation than it is about, oh, what – again, Jalen Polk's got the hands, got the route runner, doesn't – is not as long as you're not playing at a rain-soaked night on Corvallis, Jalen Polk is your guy. So I think, you know, once he kind of gets – He's got to find the right system. I think that's that's the key for Polk. He's got to find the right system. It, it's it's a matter, you know, Rome can flourish in any system. That's why he's going to be a top ten pick. But the rest of the guy, I mean, Jalen Miller, kind of in that similar mold where he's a good route runner, but could he still get better in a couple of areas? Probably, right. So where sure. those other two guys go is kind of going to be more scheme dependent, fit dependent. Rome is just going to pop off wherever he goes. Oh, 100%. And I feel like that's a great place to wrap this up. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. And please make sure we got so much fun stuff coming for you this week as it is Pro Day week. And we might have a special guest or two. We'll see. You just got to make sure you stay tuned. And the best way to do that is to make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day. So please make sure you hit that like button on the video. Make sure you hit that subscribe and that little bell icon so you never miss when we post a new video. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, guests that you want to see on the show, anything like that, please make sure to leave us a comment down below. And if you're audio only, please leave us a five-star review. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you on Tuesday.